your home country of Greece has been the focal point mm-hmm. in Europe for the crisis. Um, you know, how did it get so bad? Uh, and what now for the future of Greece and its people? Greece lost its productive basis capacity in, in, in exchange for getting into the European Union, in effect. And since then, it's been teetering on the verge of a debt crisis, but governments have always managed to somehow manage to, 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 to put the, the foot on the brake just before the edge, and then accelerate again when unemployment was coming up. So every government, whether it was a socialist government or a conservative government, initially um, stimulated the economy, then when the debt would reach the red zone, it would pull back and introduce a, a, a degree of austerity, and then the next government would accelerate again. So this was what was going on. In 2004, after the Olympics, which was a major stimulant to the economy, a new right-wing government comes in, unique in its capacity to misread the, the economic uh, landscape. And at the time when any other government would have stepped on the brake, it hit the accelerator. And it kept its foot on the accelerator throughout 2005, 2006, 2007, when the world was going, was preparing it, it to drive itself off of the, off the cliff of 2008. So when that happened, Greece was in a, the, the Greek state's finances were in an extremely precarious position anyway. So we were the first domino to go. But even if we hadn't done that, we would have been the second domino. If not the second domino, had we been extremely uh, judicious with our public finances and more productive but less corrupt as individuals and firms and companies and so on, we would have been the third domino to go. The reason why we went has to do with the fact that the Eurozone could never sustain the country in 2008. Does Greece, under the current conditions, actually have the ability to repay the debts? Under no circumstances. Greece is labouring under a mountain of debt. But what worries me more than anything is that nobody, no, not, not even the, the IMF and the EU, expect to get their money back, or they expect this this plan to be seen through and to work. This is the worst part of it. Uh, the cynicism behind it. So what did they do? You have a bankrupt state in recession, and you give it a very large new loan at usually interest rates. Now, you have to be a fool to think that this is going to solve the problem, especially when the condition for doing that is to make the country sign on the dotted line an affidavit that's going to reduce its national income. This is called austerity. Yeah, this is what the state is. It's like signing on the dotted line, I am going to reduce growth. Please give me an expensive loan. What were they up to? And the simple answer is, they were buying time for themselves. To do what? To delay making a decision about what they want to do in relation to the European, to the Eurozone. They have not worked out whether they want to bind themselves to the mast of the euro or not. And who are they? The surplus countries primarily, Germany, and the other three that uh, are holding its coattails, uh, Austria, Finland, and uh, the Netherlands. The deficit countries are simply utterly incapable of imagining even the possibility that they can speak their minds. I was talking to the finance minister of one of these deficit countries, a large deficit country, and a very clever man. Um, so when we were having our discussion, uh, he was in complete agreement with what I was saying, and he was egging me on to keep saying it outside the room. But then I turned around to him and said, um, why aren't you saying anything? I mean, I am just squeak in the grand scheme of things. I'm just an academic, nobody listens to academics, right? So. But you're the, you know, the minister of a major Eurozone country. If you come out and say this in a press conference, then all hell will break loose. 
and Europe is going to have the discussion that it's avoiding. He said, well, if I say to you, uh, see, if I say in public what I'm saying to you now, the interest rates of my country are going to shoot up by 8%, right? And we will be bankrupt. And there is no guarantee that Europe is going uh, to transform itself into a rational organization. So I'm, I just don't have the political legitimacy to drive my country into the arms of the IMF and the European Union simply by making a statement. Uh, and that made me think, you know, because it, it just made me think, uh, made me realize how happy I am not to be in politics. Because it, it, it is a kind of slavery when you can't speak your mind. Now, I disagree with him in the final analysis, I think that politicians at some point have um, um, a duty to come out and speak the truth and let all hell break loose, because all hell is breaking loose anyway. That country is already in, uh, you know, under attack by the bond in vigilantes, even though he never said anything. Just to touch on some of the points that uh, you made there, yeah, it's, it's clear that contagion is spread in the wildfire. Um, we're on the edge now, aren't we? We are. Italy and Spain are gone. And uh, the only the reason why they are not formally gone is because the European Central Bank is fighting a losing battle. It is a losing battle because everybody knows that the, the European Central Bank does not have the political backing to keep fighting, to keep in order to preserve uh, Italian and Spanish interest rates at uh, reasonable levels. But it has enough fighting power um, to, to delay it for a while. There's nothing that makes uh, mon uh, money markets happier than a target that they know that they will eventually knock off. And, you know, that's how they make money. So, once Italy and Spain go, then France comes next. And when France loses its AAA rating, then the bailouts collapse. Because the bailouts are paid through this uh, toxic uh, organization that we created in Europe called the European Financial Stability Fund whose funding comes from guarantees from France and Germany. So if Ger and you can only guarantee the FSF if you have AAA rating. So if France loses it, then the FSF goes. Yeah. Germany will refuse to do it all by itself. And then if the FSF goes, the Irish program goes, the Portuguese program goes, then spreads will explode and it will be game over. So you're right, we are on the brink. And I think there's a danger for uh, many people in the UK to see the Eurozone crisis as something else, mm -hmm. uh, an issue that is not really to, to do with us, uh, despite the majority of our trade being with the European Union. Mm -hmm. Could you just explain what you think are the implications for the UK, what is going on in the Eurozone? When the going is good, everybody, everybody talks about globalisation, the global village, that the, our fates are interconnected, and the importance of international trade, uh, the World Trade Organization and all that. But then when the crisis happens, everybody for himself or herself. Yeah. Then you have this amazing geography lesson that everybody's indulging in. You know, the Irish saying that they are not Ireland is not Greece. Portugal <laughs> saying that it's not Ireland. Uh, the, the British saying that they are not the Eurozone. Yeah. We're all in it together. This is the whole point about uh, the interconnectedness and uh, globalized capital.